Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Chris Austin. I'm the pastor of our 528 campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we are so glad you joined us here to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. So when we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together are all things that just, they don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find information about our locations, service times, and much more. We hope to see you soon. If you will, we'll get started. Uh, Keep your finger on that copy of scripture in that text in James 2. We're going to open that up today and look at that today. I don't know, I don't watch a lot of television shows. Uh, I I use TV just almost uniformly for sports, although there are a couple of shows I like. Uh, One of the shows I like is PBS's, I probably lost you at PBS when I said it, it's PBS's Antiques Roadshow. Anyone familiar with that at all? If you don't know what it is, I'll give you, the premise is uh, they bring a bunch of experts in, art, uh, antique furniture, anything, and people will bring in stuff that they've had in their attic or it's family heirlooms that's been passed down to, to be evaluated to see if they're worth something or not. And for example, like a guy from Tulsa brought in some uh, cups that were made from rhinoceros horns. You can't do that today, but these were from the 1700s and he paid five grand for them. I wouldn't even know what to pay for for something like that. It doesn't seem like a lot, but they were valued at $1.2 million. I mean, he left going, well, that was a, that was a good investment. I'm, I'm, I'm walking around like, hey, baby, is this Bucky's cup going to do anything? What would it be? But sometimes they go into these scenarios where the guy or gal thinks they've got an article worth a whole lot of money, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's not. Here's one of them. I'll show you the picture. Here's this guy. This was Antique Roadshow in England. So the guy on the left uh, that's not in the suit, that was, this is the painting that he brought in. The guy on the right in the suit is the art expert. And so this artwork that you see here, this guy says on the left, hey, this has been in my family for generations. My family bought, my ancestors bought this in the 1850s. And he goes, well, what do you think you have here? He's like, well, I have, I believe this is a 17th century painting by Sir Peter Lely, uh, and it's probably worth about $1.5 or $1.25 million. And then the expert on the right there looks at it and goes, nope, it's a forgery. <clears throat> and the guy, of course, was, what do you mean it's a forgery? So here's what he does. He goes through and he just looks at the different signs that show that it's a fake. He says, well, first of all, the size is too small. Uh, Lily did big things. This has been domesticated so it can fit someone's home. Uh, the frame's all wrong. That's a 19th century version of what someone thinks that a 17th century version ought to look like. Uh, the paint colors aren't Lily's. He would never use those kind of paint colors. The hand, he talks about this hand there, that the hand is very clunky. clunky. Uh, Lily would never draw a hand like that. And to top it all off, there, there's a brown sheen that's been placed over it to make it look like it's old. So what you have for your family for generations has been passing down a forgery. It's always a good day at Antiques Roadshow when that happens. <clears throat> One guy said, no kidding. One of their viewers, I love the Brits, man. They're just so, they're cold-blooded. He just said, fake, he's gutted. That's what he says. Uh, <laughs> That's not going to go back on the wall with near the family piano. Now their daughter can just draw a mustache on it. I'm like, this guy's a bitter dude, man. But what he thought was worth a whole lot of money, $1.25 million, this guy said it's a forgery. It's not even over 1000 bucks. Now, as you might imagine, this gentleman was very disappointed because for generations, what he and his family thought was legitimate and authentic proved to be fake. And I was just kind of blown away by that. Pretty wild to think that, there, that you can have some kind of knowledge about you, some kind of expertise about you, that you can look at something and by looking at different signs, tell whether it's authentic or not. I mean, wouldn't you like to have that power? I mean, I, I'm a barbecue guy. I love to barbecue. I just smoked a, a, a couple of pork butts last night for my wife for some stuff that we're doing, what she's going to do with one of our church camps. And I mean, I, I feel like I can I mean, I like meat, but I'm not some pro. Like, if I were to go over here to some steakhouse, and they were like, hey, listen, this is going to be a $300 steak because it's Wagyu beef. And all of a sudden, I was like, eh, look at the striations in it. That's not Wagyu. That's choice. You know, something like that. It's like, that's like $5. That ain't 100 or 300 bucks. Or like some of you, maybe uh, 
someone comes to you guys or one of you ladies and she's showing off her Louis Vuitton bag and you kind of look at the straps, you're like, oh, look at the straps and the color, the way that LV is. No, 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 you bought that off of Harwin in Northwest Houston is where you got that. That's <laughs> off the Harwin Street. We know where that came from. It's a $3 bag. Um, or if someone pays you money for work you've done, all of a sudden you see it's like orange and yellow and blue, the, 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 the leaflets are, I mean the copies of the, the, the caches, you'd know that would be fake. Like that would be a cool power to have. But then I think it's, it's not that cool. I mean, it's kind of limited. I mean, because you can, you can get by with a cheap steak or a fake purse or, frankly, monopoly money. But what if the question had to do with your faith? Now the stakes are way high. Because we're not just talking about uh, you're paying too much for a steak or you got some fake little bag you want to tote around. I'm talking about, like, if you're wrong on this, if what you thought that you had for your life was authentic, only at your death to be proved that it was fake, that would be an eternal consequence you don't want to have to live with. I mean, it wouldn't be eternal life, it would be eternal death. And there's a reason why I think it's such a big question, because a ton of people have a ton of different answers. What does it mean that you're a Christian? Well, some people will say, well, I was born in America, America is generally a Christian perspective on a nation, so I'm a Christian. Other people will say, no, I'm a Christian because... My parents were deacons. Uh, no, I'm a Christian because I grew up in church. No, I'm a Christian because I go to services. No, I'm a Christian because I said a prayer when I was four. No, I'm a, you know, it just keeps going on and on and on. What, what does a real Christian look like? It's a great question. So here's, here's what's going to happen today as we get into James chapter 2. <clears throat> if you could see and understand, based on having an expert of faith in the room, that your faith was genuine, it might fire you up. It might be like, oh, you know, God, this just reaffirms to me your goodness. I want to still get on mission, live for you. But what if you had an expert in the room that said, your faith, you might want to check it because I'm not too sure it's genuine. Now that would, much like this man on this Peter Lilly uh, artwork, he, would be, he was initially disappointed, and I'm assuming you would be disappointed too if you felt like, oh, maybe my faith isn't real. But actually... If it, if it led you to dig more deeply into what Jesus says about who he is in the kingdom, if it, if it ultimately led you into kind of a real faith, I would argue that this kind of exercise that we're going to do today isn't a curse at all. It's actually a blessing because there might be, I don't know, there may be people in here with the illusion that they have real Christian faith, <clears throat> but they don't. Now, here's, I need you to say this. I didn't say this last service. I'm going to say it here. My goal is not to say what you have or don't have. I don't know that. Only, only God does. And I'm, I don't want to sow false. Uh, I don't, I don't want to sow fear into your heart if, 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 if it doesn't need to be there. And I definitely, on the other hand, though, don't want to give you false assurance. Like, I, I want to stay away from both of those things. I just want to let you hear what the Bible says as, uh, think about it this way. Today in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, we're going to go to a um, Bible antique roadshow. But it's not an antique roadshow. It's a Bible faith road show because people are coming before James, who's the expert in the room, saying, is my faith real or is my faith not real? Is it, is it a counterfeit? And James is going to take one person and he's going to examine this person. Just like this guy brought a painting, this person's bringing the artwork of himself and what he's going to show here is that this person says, I'm a Christian because I believe and have faith that Jesus is who he said he is, and God is who he said he is, and the world is as it is because this is what the Bible teaches. I'm a Christian because I agree to these truths. And so what James is going to do now is he's going to put that person before us, and we're going to walk through his argument about why this person is or maybe is not a believer. At least the question should be there. So what we're looking for is, is there kind of like what this guy did with the Lily painting? Is there signs? Is there a size, a shape, a color, a, a style in a believer that would make them more look like authentic, believing Christians versus people that think they are, but they're not. I'd want to get to know that. So we will. And here's how James starts it. Verse 14. Just look at verse 14. <clears throat> he starts it with the question at hand. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? So there we go. Here's someone going, listen, I've got faith, but you don't see it in my life. I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. But for all intents and purposes... Functionally, you never see that in, in my life at all. And so James is simply saying, if we we're going to use this language of antique roadshow, hey, is this guy the real article? Someone that says that I have faith, but you never see it in their life, really, is that person a true, genuine Christian? Do they have the product? Are they the product of the master's hand? So you're going to see really early on in this text, James starts to show his hand in that in verses 15 through 17. Let's look at that. 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and asking in daily food, so here's the illustration. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, I go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, <clears throat> is dead. Just stop there for a second. Let me just kind of sit down. Let's have a chat here. James gives this illustration by saying, let me, let me tell you, you tell me if it's a good faith or not. Let's imagine that you're a Christian. <clears throat> you're walking down Bay Area Boulevard, and you find one of your Christian brothers and sisters from Clear Creek there, and they're desperately in need of food and clothing. Like something's happened, and they haven't eaten in forever, and they're barely even clothed. And you say in kind of a, a nice religious way, give them a little blessing, hey, I, I hope that you find food and find clothing. Be filled and, and well taken care of. But you don't do anything about it. James simply says they're like, the, is that helpful or not? And the answer, in what, the way James talks about it, it's pretty understood. He's like, no, it's, it's pretty much worthless. It's, it's, no, it's no good at all. It's like an umbrella, buying an umbrella without a canopy. <clears throat> it's like having a comb without the teeth on it. And it, it's, it's essentially, to use our language from the beginning, it's like having a painting you thought was real but was only made by a, forgerist, a forger. So it, James paints a very different picture. Look, look at the end of this, verse 17. So if that's true... Also, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is what? Dead. Yeah, dead. Now listen, uh, I want you to be very clear. Dead is not good in this passage. To be dead is not something you want. So for example, like you need some work around the house, don't ask a dead person, right? Why? Because they can't help you because they're, say it with me, dead. they're dead. They're not going to go anywhere and do anything. They're dead. I'm not trying to make you morbid or make you sad. I'm just saying they're not good for anything. That's all James is saying here. James wants it to be very clear from the start that anyone who claims to believe in Jesus, y'all need to listen to me on this one, whatever, whatever person, whoever, claims to believe in Jesus, and yet you functionally don't see any spiritual impulse in their life of Jesus, he's like, that faith is it's dead. It's dead. Now, I, I would say it in a positive way just to kind of nail down this idea. Here's, I'll put it on the screen for you. Here's how we'll think about it. Real faith makes a real difference you can really see. I think that's really the whole thing with James. I'm not asking you to now, now that that's the theme, you don't have to study it anymore. It's still good to read the rest of it. But if I could put all the theme of James into one line, especially this passage, it'd be this. Real faith makes a real difference you can really see. I'm going to say that a lot today. So just, just to, you know, humor me a little bit, say it with me. Ready? Real faith makes a real difference that you can really see. Now, <clears throat> we're going to hit that up quite a bit because that's all James is saying here. Now, listen. Once he says that, he knows he's going to get some pushback. He's a good teacher. He's a smart guy. Because someone's going to go, hold on, man. I mean, you just busted the guy who said that he was a Christian. I mean, who are you to judge, right? Get the head shake and the finger. Who are you to tell him when he's not a Christian? Who are you to say that he's fake? Well, let's look what James does. He's got a guy here in this text <clears throat> that, uh, well, let's look at the objection in verses 18 and 19. But someone's going to say, or someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. So notice what James has done. So he's anticipating the objection is this. He brings this, this guy comes before him on the biblical faith road show and says, listen, I'm a Christian. I know you don't see it anywhere in my life, uh, but I believe. Deep down in my heart, I believe. And maybe God just made us two different people. You're kind of a works Christian, and I'm kind of a belief Christian. Like, we both have faith. Everyone can see your faith uh, mine's just very personal, private. It's, it's, just, it's just there. And so James kind of says, all right, well, listen, um, I, I, I don't know if that's a really good faith to have. Now, people will go, well, no one would ever talk like this. No one would ever say, like, this person has a faith you can see, and this person has a faith that you can't see, and they're both legitimate. God just makes us two different people. But I do think people talk like this. They just don't use this language. Here, here's the language I hear. You can't see, uh, and, and when people try to justify that you've really known... You've never seen any kind of practical outworking of faith in their lives. You know, they might show up at church once and forever and say that they accepted Jesus when they were seven and, you know, never darkened the doors of a church or anything else again. They would simply say, well, you know, my faith's private. I have a private faith. Maybe that's 
a rationale or a reason that you've given before. Hey, listen, man, just it's okay. It's between me and God. I hear that all the time. I'm spiritual. It's just between me and God. I don't have to do that. I don't have to show anybody else. God knows what I'm talking about. God's got me now. My faith is private. And what happens is often that's the product of a, <laughs> of a nice North American life where everything's compartmentalized. We have PhDs in compartmentalization. Like everything's up in a different box in our life. This is our sex life. This is our work life. This is our home life. This is our married life, this is our school life, this is our sports life, and all of a sudden you have all these boxes where your life happens, then you ask, well, what about your spiritual life? Well, hey, that's, that's private. That's, that's personal, right? And then you go, well, can you describe to me even what your Christian faith looks like? Oh, yeah, I can tell you what it is. I believe Jesus came, that he died on the cross for my sins, and that he rose from the dead. I believe that. And when you ask, what do you mean by that you believe that? I believe that that's true. In other words, the way that they see their faith is that God, if you will, is going to give them a test when they die, going, all right, if you get 70% or above on these questions, I'm going to let you in. And the idea is this. As long as I have the right ideas and the facts, as long as I believe that they're true, somehow I'm a Christian. In fact, I, I, I can... I can see why a lot of Christians, uh, let me take that back, let me rewind that phrase. I can see why a lot of people who claim to be Christians believe that and think that way. As long as I have the right answers, I must be saved. It's because we've lived in a church that hasn't helped with that. In fact, they fostered that kind of idea. I'd say that false salvation, at least false assurance by just having the right answers. I mean, all the way since the 50s, when revivalism was sweeping through America, there were a lot of pastors and a lot of evangelists who, with well-meaning hearts, wanted to see as many people as possible come to Jesus. But what happened, that somewhere down the road, they, they begin to dumb down and strip down and make kind of faith into the lowest common denominator of facts that you needed to agree to, and that's what made you saved. That's why, how many of you grew up with here in tracks like the four spiritual laws? There's only four of them. If you did Campus Crusade, my wife's part of campus, I'm not knocking it. I'm saying, like, that's the thing that you had. Or they come down and say a sinner's prayer. And what you do is you just regurgitate the words that I'm telling you. All right, God, I'm a sinner. I believe. I and so as long as you agree to these facts, this lowest common denominator of, I don't know, three or four things, then somehow if you think that that's true, <clears throat> you're a Christian. And that reductionistic approach to really Christianity and the gospel, I think, has not helped us at all. I think it's hurt us a bunch. And I know this kind of sounds like a rant, but I believe it's true. Because ultimately what I think is it made a lot of decisions, but it didn't make a lot of disciples. A lot of people made a lot of decisions. They ain't coming down and sign, sign it and say a prayer, got baptized, then they're gone. No real difference in their life. No change in their values. No desire for the kingdom. And again, I know I'm painting some pretty broad brushes. I'm, again, I'm just speaking generally. But what happens, we had a whole lot of decisions made, but not a lot of disciples made. And tragically, here's what happened. Because of that kind of emphasis in the church, it produced tons of people, tons of people, who don't follow Jesus Christ in their lives because they think all that faith really is is agreeing with some facts about Jesus in their head. That's who James is dealing with. He's basically dealing with a North American from the last 50, 60, 70 years about what it is to be a Christian. As long as I agree to some facts about God, I'm in, because that's what real faith is. And James is about to break that open. Here comes the expert at the Antique Faith Roadshow. Let's go look back at verse 18. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. First of all, James is just playing out this absurd idea that, hey, I've just got this kind of faith that's private. He's like, well, show me your private faith. I can't. It's private. Well, that's the whole point, right? Like, you can't show me a faith that you don't have. And all that someone who says that their faith is private can do is this. They can only tell you what they believe as far as facts. They'll say, well, I'm a Christian because I believe, which means I agree that Jesus died on a cross and he rose from the dead and I said that prayer. And that's, I'm in. I'm in. I agree with that. In other words, they... If God gave me the test, I'd really give the right answers. I'd say, like, God is one God, and he exists in Trinity. I know it's a mystery, but I believe that's true. And Jesus, notice what John, excuse me, what James does here. <clears throat> Verse 19. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. I, I, this is one of the most hardcore, cold-blooded moves I've seen in the Bible. So he just puts this person right before him, and this guy's like, well, I'm a Christian because I agree to these facts. Like what? Well, I mean, I believe God's one. And James like, that's cool. 
you believe in Orthodox Christian belief that God, you're a monotheist, welcome. I'm a monotheist too, that's awesome. Here's the difference. Even the demons are monotheistic. Even the demons believe what you believe. And at least, and this is what's ironic, at least they have a response in their life. They shudder, you don't do a thing. And so here's where it really gets like, I mean, this is some heat on this text if you put your finger there long enough. <clears throat> what, what, what he's saying here is that, listen, if you have a faith that's a lot of talk about what you believe is true, but it never comes up into your life, you have more in common with the demonic than the disciples. That's the kind of faith you have. You have a demonic faith. In fact, the demons have a better faith than you do because at least they have a response. So for the person that says, hey, my faith's private, it doesn't really need to surface in any one of these boxes in my life as long as I keep them in boxes, James would say, you know what? Based on the size and the shape and the color and the style, I'm not too sure you're a work of the master. That's what he's saying here. Not me. He's saying that, right? Why? Y'all want to say this with me? Here's why. Because real faith makes a real difference that you can really see. Period. That's James's assertion. In other words, know this. Faith is always personal. It's never private. Faith's never private. Everything that makes you who you are bubbles up somewhere in your life because you actually believe it, not just in your head, but in your heart. And if you believe it in your head and your heart, it comes out in your hands. That's all James is trying to say here. In fact, he's simply saying this. When Jesus gets a hold of someone, he actually gets a hold of them by the power of the Spirit, that God produces in them a kind of desire for the kingdom that you can see over a lifetime. Now, let me just say this just to make you, just to help us out here. <clears throat> doesn't mean that you're perfect. Doesn't mean that you don't have times of struggle. Doesn't mean that you can't sin. Doesn't mean that you can have seasons where you feel pretty backslidden. I, I'll put all that on the table. But what James is simply saying is this. If someone says they're a follower of Jesus, they actually follow Jesus. And we think that's crazy. But all he's trying to say is, well, I mean, that we said that we're followers of Jesus. You just follow Jesus. doesn't mean that you're perfect in that following, but somewhere there's an impulse in you, an impulse in you to want to live for the kingdom of God because the Holy Spirit's in you. That's how Christ is in you today. The Holy Spirit's in you to produce those kinds of things, and you're kind of kicking and screaming maybe along the way. We get it, but there's got to be some kind of difference in you because real faith makes a real difference that you can see. See, what happens far too often, especially in Christendom and North American evangelicalism, is like no one wants to go to hell. I get it. I don't want to go either. But so what we do is we think, well, what's the least amount of work I got to do to not go to hell? What's the least amount of work I got to do? Not? Well, I got to say this prayer and believe these things are true, and I'm in. And then it just doesn't work. Because there's got to be a real transformation of the heart. What happens is too many people want to be saved from something. They don't want to lord over anything. They, they, want, they love Jesus to save them from hell, but they don't want to have to actually serve that Jesus as the Lord and King in their life. And just so you know, Jesus never divvies himself up. He comes in one package. That, that's, that's why when you look at James, it thinks he's talking tough, right? Because for North Americans, like, oh my gosh, this is just so hard. What's he doing? Does he even know Jesus? Yes, it's his half-brother. Um, <clears throat> The kind of faith that James is looking for is a faith that's given where a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, someone has given themselves to Jesus and trusted solely in the work of Christ on their behalf, not just as their Savior, but as their King. The problem North Americans have and people and friends would have and Lake, in League City and everyone else is we just like to be our own lords. Because you got a lot of money, you got a lot of mobility, you don't need to listen to anybody, right? Neither do I. But the point is, Jesus comes as a king, not just as someone deliverer, as a king, and he comes together for that. That's what James was looking for. Who's submitting to the king? Not perfect. They can have a lot of problems. They can screw up all the time, but they at least have an impulse to want to serve the king, and that impulse comes out in their life. It's not just the head, it's the hands and the heart as well. In fact, James isn't the only guy that believes that, that people ought to have a real faith, makes a real difference. You can see there's this other guy named Jesus. Maybe you've heard of him. He says the same thing. John 15 says it this way. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. You're connected to me. What does that mean? It means whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that what? Bears much fruit. He's like, you want to know, the, you want to know what a Christian looks like? They bear fruit. If you're, what, if I'm, what if I'm a Christian but I'm fruitless? You're not a Christian is what Jesus would say. Christians bear fruit. Uh, James wasn't the only one. Jesus didn't feel it. This guy named Paul, you probably heard of him too. 
I grew up in a Baptist tradition. Uh, once my father became, was an atheist, became a Christian. And I heard this text that I had to memorize all the time. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourself. It's a gift of God so that no man shall boast. See, you're saved by grace, you're saved by grace, you're saved by grace. And that's true. But no one ever wanted to read the next verse, which says this in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what, y'all? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What? You mean beforehand? Yeah. God predestined that he would rescue you from the pit of hell and bring you into his kingdom so that you would do good works. What kind of works? Works for the kingdom, which he prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Sounds like real faith makes a real difference in someone's life that you can really see. The same thing he says here, Paul says to Philippians 1.8, to the church at Philippi, he says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, ooh, he's going to good work again. He who began the salvation in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. So when Jesus starts, he finishes. And that looks like a very real way in our lives. That's why, why am I giving you these passages? These are all singing different verses of one song. And that song is this, real faith, makes a real difference that you can really see. Now, just to kind of put his finer little exclamation mark at the end of this argument that he's making, remember, James is the leader of the church of Jerusalem. Jerusalem got busted up because of persecution, but because it was in Jerusalem, most of these Christians were Jewish Christians, Jewish in their background. They had some heroes, and of their heroes was Abraham, Father Abraham, and many sons. Okay, some of you know. Um, I guess there's three of us that sing it. So, um, and then another one, the second one he likes to invoke here is Rahab. Rahab is a lady of the night. I know he's going to say it here later, so I, I will, he's a, she's a prostitute. She's, not a, she's kind of of ill repute and ill rapport. But she was a Gentile, and she risked her life on behalf of Israel, and they've never forgotten it. In fact, let's just read the text, because he wants to show them, like, look at the people that you love. Look at their faith. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person? And notice James is locked and loaded already. He talks to this person as if they're foolish, the person whose faith is private that you can never see. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Because that's been his whole point. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed. We're going to go back to completed here in a second. By his works, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers, these Israelite spies, and sent them out another way. Notice this conclusion, verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith, so also faith apart from works is what? It's dead, all right? So here's what Abraham does. He said, listen, you guys and your pantheon of like heroes of the faith, let me just pick two of them, Abraham and Rahab. Genesis 22, Abraham does what? God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. See how much you're committed to me. And Abraham's like, I'll go do it. Of course, God makes him not do that, but he wanted to see his faith. But you have to see faith for faith to be there. And then the second thing he says is Rahab. That's Joshua, 20, uh, Joshua 2. She's this really pagan Gentile and sees God's people coming in and she gives them safe harbor coming into the new promised land. She gives them safe harbor at the risk of her life. The whole point James is trying to make, and I'm not going to belabor it, is simply this. Why do you celebrate Abraham and Rahab? Because you see something to celebrate. You see a change in their life. You see that real faith makes a real difference that you can see. That's why he concludes, look at verse 24. <clears throat> I'm going to have to explain this, so y'all just read this with me. You see that, a, based on all that, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now listen, if you've read the Bible for any number of years, that sounds like the exact opposite of what you've been reading. If you read, for example, Paul, especially in Romans, where Paul says the exact opposite. He says you're saved by faith alone. You are justified by faith alone. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, that sounds like, Yancey, that Paul was at least saying that we don't do good works to be saved, that it's our faith in Christ and Christ's work to be saved. And just, that's not Paul, Yancey. We, I kind of think like for the last, it'll be 30 years in October at Clear Creek, for 30 years, y'all have kind of said the same thing, and you're right, you got us. We, we've said for the last 30 years that salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone, by sheer grace alone. That the only works that we bring to our salvation uh, before becoming saved is our sin, and Jesus brings the goodness of his perfection to redeem us of those sins. That's so true. So when people read verse 24, it just junks them up. Because it sounds like 
sounds like I've got to be saved by, not by my faith alone, but by my good deeds as well. Is that what James is saying? No, it's not what James is saying. Let me tell you why. When you look in the book of Romans, for example, every time you see Paul use the word justified, <clears throat> it's basically shorthand for being made right with God or salvation. So he says, um, it's only faith alone that justifies us. Faith alone saves us. That's all he's saying. But as you look at the context of James, different author, not Paul, this is James. James is using justified in a completely different way. James is using justified in a way to say vindicated or proven true. Or as we saw just a few verses earlier, completed. What he's simply saying here is this. In other words, James is saying that your life and the transformation in your life vindicates the, the faith that you say that you have. That's all he's trying to say. He's simply saying that when you live for Jesus throughout your life, that proves true, completes the faith that you say that you have. In other words, uh, for James, a transformed life is the size and the color and the style of the canvas that shows the work of the master's hand and it's not been a forgery. I, I know this is for some of you like, uh, I had a guy earlier who said, I've, I'm a brand new Christian. You can see what you said the whole time made no sense till the end. So let me, let me get, to get to the end to tie some of this stuff up. <clears throat> It's always appreciative if someone says, you make no sense. <clears throat> you teach it, man. It's hard. Um, <clears throat> centuries ago, I'll give you some more church history here. We'll go a little further than the uh, 1950s. So in, the, um, in probably the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, all the way up to the 16th, the church kind of got off its wheels a little bit. You get sinful people and power, uh, and even the best of men and women can go awry. And the church had kind of lost its way. In fact, if you could summarize for many people growing up in church in the later part of the 15th and early part of the 16th century, they would summarize this salva salvation in this formula. We'll put it on the screen for you. It's faith plus works equals salvation. What they heard being taught and probably what was being taught is that if you want to be saved, if you want real faith, you've got to believe in Jesus plus be good. You have to do things in order to equal to get salvation. Well... Uh, in 1517, on October 31st, which, by the way, is the, not the year, but the date Clear Creek started, October 31st, a little later, 1993, um, there was this guy named Martin Luther who was like, dude, this is all messed up. This is so far from the gospel. And it wasn't just him. It was guys like him and Philip Melanchthon and uh, John Calvin, some others, who said, like, we need to reform the church back to the gospel. And the gospel is that salvation comes by faith alone. So we might write it this way. It's actually the, the Bible teaches that it's faith alone that saves you. But, but they were just trying to counteract what they saw was a gross, and it was this egregious move by the church. Like, no, we need to rescue the church back to the gospel, and they did. The problem was that now they're, they were so scared of works, they wouldn't mention it anywhere. Some of them wouldn't. In, in fact, uh, Martin Luther didn't even like the book of James. He didn't even want it in the Bible. Sorry, you don't get that option, Luther. So here, here's, let me give you what I would say is a more biblical formula would be something like this. Faith equals salvation, but works come with it. Here's what I mean by that so you don't get confused. Notice where work stands. It's not on the front side, it's on the back side. In other words, I don't work with my faith to be saved. It's my faith alone in Christ that saves me by the grace of God. I get salvation, but that salvation is seen in my works. Y'all follow me? There's a difference one says you have to, the top one says you have to have works to be saved. The other one says your works are a product of your salvation. That's a better way to look at this. So uh, the, the last two are true, but that's more holistic. And all James is trying to say, Romans is the second line. That's all Paul's trying to talk about. Faith alone saves, faith alone saves. And James is trying to say, hey, listen, don't get too crazy. Faith alone saves, but you're going to see some demonstration of that faith in your life. That salvation is going to work itself out. In fact, we'll even see language in the New Testament like uh, the obedience of faith. Well, what is that talking about? Work out your faith, your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what we're talking about, y'all. That, that works don't save you, but they show, at least in James's mind, and I think, this, I'm, I think James is working with Jesus on this stuff, that works show that your heart's been changed. In fact, I, I invoked Calvin. I'll do it again. John Calvin said this. He said, it is true that faith alone, that, it is faith alone that saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. <laughs> Such a killer line. It's faith alone that saves. But the faith that saves is never alone because it's got a transformation to it. And what if it is alone, Nancy, though? What if, what if I'm that person 
who's like, no, it's just private. I don't. It's I got all my boxes covered, but my spiritual world is just it's just interior. I don't have to. Show, it's just between me and God. Well, just look at how. Let's go back to verse twenty six and look at how how James concludes this whole thing. It's pretty straightforward. He just actually mirrors what he said at the beginning. As for the body, excuse me. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead. So faith apart from works is dead. In other words, a body has to have a soul in it. It's got to have a spirit in it to, to live. Once that spirit's gone, you put them in the ground. He's saying, so, so also, if, if your faith doesn't have any production of works in it, there's, there's no sign of regeneration. You know what? Um, if, if you have a faith that's like not in my life faith, it's, what, can I just go back to the analogy? James would simply say here, it's a forgery. At worst, it's a forge. Maybe at best, you're just you just you're really in a bad spot, and you need to get out of that bad spot. But for the most part, it's a forgery. It's a fake. It's it's a counterfeit. Might as well draw a mustache on it. It's not worth much anything. Why? Real faith makes a real difference. You can really see. Say it with me. Real faith makes a real difference. You can really see. Listen. I, I, let me kind of wrap this stuff up. Um, we can we can live with all kinds of fake things. You can live with a fake hand, handbag. Uh, you, you can live with fake hair, fake teeth. I'll just I'll stop right there. I don't even know where if I, that's going to go really bad somewhere. <laughs> stop. Uh, I'll tell you this. Um, you cannot live with a fake faith. And, and I'm telling you, James doing us a favor. The Lord's doing us a favor through James because he might be lighting some of you guys up for all the right reasons. Because it's not, it's not loving to keep you with a false kind of assurance of an illusion that you have a faith that's not really there. And if it's not there, then you got to go, what, what do I really believe? Because here's the deal. Here's how you cannot fix it. You can't go, well, I'll just add works in my life. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, I, got, I got the facts about Jesus here. Uh, well, again, so do the demons. So it can't be about knowing more facts. Here's what's got to happen. If, if, if this is about really... Um, if this is about salvation, it's not about works, it's about salvation that produces good works in us, then you've got a salvation issue, not a works issue. And when it comes to salvation, I can't help you, only Jesus can. So ultimately, you've got a Jesus issue. What I mean by that is this, what are you coming to Jesus for? Do you want something from him or do you want him? There's a difference. Because if you just want something from him like Santa Claus, he's just not playing that game. He, you've got to have him for him. That's why it's not enough just to have a Savior to save you from something. You've got to have to want to have a Lord to live under. But I would tell you that Lord that we live under is, find, is where you find the greatest freedom. I mean, Jesus says, take my burden upon me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 10.10, 10, I mean, that's where we have life. He's come to, have, we've come, to, he's come to give us life and life abundantly. So, but you've got to want to have Jesus for Jesus. And that's why when it comes to like, well, where, where do I go next here? Listen, um, Trust in the person at work. Uh, I don't even like to use faith language because so many people think faith equals just believing some truths. I think about trust. Who are you trusting in for your salvation? Is it just Jesus to lock me away in a kind of get out of hell, gel, uh, get out of hell card um, in the back pocket? Or have I really given Jesus my life to go, Jesus, for all that I know that I am, I give it to you. And I, there's a lot I don't know. And I'm, I'm going to have imperfect faith. But as much as I know, I'm going to trust you for who you are and what you've done. And that you're the king and that I'm not. That's where faith starts, y'all. Um, listen, it's personal. It's not private. We want to look for the signs of the master's hand in all of us. But if you want to look for it, you look for this. Real faith makes a real difference that you can really see. Let's pray. Father, uh, I mean, honestly, Lord, and you know my heart behind this, it's, it's, it's sobering to read such direct words from one of your servants, filled with your spirit. Like you, you led James to write exactly those things. And I, I actually think that one of the most loving things that we can do is to as graciously and winsomely um, and as lovingly as we can speak truth. And I think there's been truth that's been spoken. So, Lord, as I said from the beginning, I, I would say to you, for everyone who's one of your children, I don't want them to have any doubts. I don't want them to have kind of a you know, that I've created something that doesn't need to be there. I would just pray, Lord, by your spirit, that those that uh, know you and trust you would feel more encouraged that you're working in them all the way to the end, as James tells us and Paul tells us and Jesus tells us. But, Lord, I, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there may be people here, Lord, who've grown up in kind of a cultural Christianity where they think faith is just adopting and agreeing to a handful of truths, and that kind of makes them Christian. 
instead of embracing you through your son. I mean, embracing your son and repenting and turning from them being their own Lord and Savior to the only true Lord and Savior there will ever be. Jesus Christ, your son, our king. So, Lord, I would just pray that you would work in them. Like, today would be the day that the, that the scales fell off their eyes and the illusion uh, was dissipated in their vision and they, they saw Jesus for who he really is, the majestic king of kings of whose kingdom there will be no end. And so, Lord, I pray for all of my friends in this room that, Lord, you would work in them in the way that you've chosen to work in them, in a way that shows that you love them deeply, that grace is for them and it's found in the person and work in the kingdom of Jesus. It's in his name and for his kingdom we pray. Amen.